I think this is going to have another 800 houses in off the top of my head. So another huge section of the estate here. Hiya folks and welcome back. If you've been following the renovation series of videos, we've reached quite an exciting stage, for me anyway, since that series can now neatly merge with a series that I started about three years ago about how new build houses in the UK are made. So lots to cover in this video. I'll give you a full tour of the new build that we ended up buying and I'll talk about some of the internal features that you can expect to find in a modern house in the UK these days. I'm going to cover off a couple of common questions that came up in the first part of this series including whether or not this is a concrete slab often referred to as slab on grade in the states or whether it's block and beam I'll give you a clue it's not block and beam and later on I'll show you some before and after footage of what these half built houses ended up looking like three years down the line so very briefly, in case you haven't watched the videos before this, we spent many years doing renovations of older houses. We finished our last renovation and moved into a rental that happened to be a new build. We quite liked it and decided to buy our own new build house off plan. So before I show you how all the internals of a typical UK new build work, let's just have a little chat about utilities and communications. There are four major services that generally get supplied as standard with a new house. Obviously electricity, this is supplied at 240 volts in the UK and generally comes in through black ducting with yellow warning tape over the top. Mains water comes in through blue MDPE pipework. If you're not already aware, water in the UK is of exceptional quality. We never have to buy bottled water. The tap water, or council pop as it used to get called, is just as good. Most properties come with a natural gas supply, a standard fed directly from the nationwide gas network. They come in in yellow pipes. And then of course there's the phone lines or communication lines that you randomly get and that vastly varies from development to development. There's essentially three options. There's copper telephone lines that generally run in grey ducts and they're provided by open reach normally. If you're very lucky you'll get fibre to the premises and they'll generally run in the same open reach grey ducts. You'll sometimes get cable lines from the likes of Virgin Media and they can be either coax or fibre lines and they're normally run in green ducts. And of course you can have satellite services provided by the likes of Sky but I'm not going to talk about those because they're generally installed after the house is built and it still generally uses the lines provided by Openreach for your actual internet connections. When we bought our new build seven years ago, there was only one option, and that was traditional copper phone lines. They are starting to roll out fibre to the premises in new houses, and it's definitely something worth asking about. If you're about to buy a new build, I would certainly advise trying to get fibre put in as standard if you can get it. I wish more estates would also give the option of Virgin Media, but in my experience that's something that might get installed later down the line if you're lucky and if it's available at your local exchange. I generally use Sam Knows to check out what is available in a particular area. I'll include a link to that in the description below. For example, you can see for the Gosforth Exchange, that exchange services over 17,000 properties and includes support for Virgin Media. However, the exchange that we were connected to, which was a wide open exchange, services about 6,000 houses, but doesn't have Virgin Media at the exchange. So the chances of ever having Virgin as an option in the new build houses are slim to nil. It's also worth mentioning that when you buy a new build, it can sometimes take months before you have a working internet line of any description. Check this with the developer before the house completes. In our case, we had to make do with a basic ADSL service of about five meg, and it took over two years before we were able to get fiber to the cabinet with speeds of about 35 meg, since all of the open reach fiber cabinets were full. So do bear that in mind with new builds. Quiz your developer on what's available and try and get the ball rolling on the order process for your internet lines as quickly as possible. Right, let me show you around the house that we ended up buying. Some of this footage is from after we moved out, so hence there's a bit of wear and tear and things. Obviously, when we bought the property, everything was brand new. This is a reasonably sized five bedroom property. 
I, I say five bedroom. It's got four bedrooms and a smaller fifth bedroom that you could really view it more as a dressing room. But technically it is five bed. And we'll start off at the front door. The first thing that you're going to notice in new builds is that security is a major consideration. All of the downstairs doors are multi-point locking with steel cladding on both the inside and outside of every external door. Obviously all of the windows are multi-point locking as well. We're then into a nice spacious hallway. We paid extra for tiled floors which in hindsight was a mistake. I'd only do that again if there was some sort of guarantee against cracking due to the settling of the concrete slab or if it was a block and beam floor which is less susceptible to settling. Ask your developer whether it's a concrete slab or block and beam. I'll talk more about that later on. It's a good idea to get the builder to fit all of the flooring for you, in my opinion, because then it's their responsibility to trim all of the doors and to make sure that any solid flooring runs underneath the skirting boards. If you plan on installing your own flooring, be prepared to remove and refit all of your doors and skirtings while you're at it. We touched on utilities before. In this house, the electric supply comes in via this cupboard under the stairs, and that's also where the electric meter is located. The water supply comes in underneath the utility room sink and the gas runs under the floor all the way to the boiler at the back of the property and the gas meter is located outside which is a very common way of doing things. I forgot to mention too, new builds will generally come with a water meter as standard. If you're not used to being on a metered supply then get used to it. The meter itself is generally located on public land outside the property, normally embedded in a footpath. Central heating in UK new builds will almost always use water filled radiators, although we'll, we'll touch on that because that might not be the case from 2025 onwards. Boiler wise, you're generally going to have either a combi boiler with hot water on demand or you're going to have a system boiler with an unvented hot water cylinder. Smaller houses tend to have a combi boiler, larger houses tend to have the unvented system. I'm not going to explain the difference on here, other than the fact that combi boilers heat your hot water on demand, whereas unvented systems store the hot water in a tank. Personally, I prefer a combi boiler since we tend to have long showers and there's no risk of running out of hot water. Having said that, combi boilers generally struggle in bigger properties. I'm not going to attempt to explain any of that in any more detail. I'll just link to James over at Plumber Parts. Hiya, James, in the description, since he's already written some excellent articles explaining the pros and cons of both systems. Anyway, in this house, we've got a two-zone unvented system with an ideal logic system boiler in the kitchen and a hot water tank in an airing cupboard on the top floor. And by two zone, I mean there's two thermostats. So we've got one thermostat that controls the temperature in the bedrooms and we've got another that controls the temperature in the rest of the house. And remember, all of the radiators have got thermostatic valves on anyway, which is pretty standard these days. One thing to look out for here is that the master control unit is sometimes in a bedroom and that can be a total pain. If you ever want to manually switch the heating on and there happens to be a child asleep in that room, just something to bear in mind. Try to find a house that doesn't put the master control unit and hot water tank in a bedroom. Because this is a three-story property, all of the doors have to be fire doors and they've all got intumescent seals around them. The doors have their good and bad points. They're basically just chipboards, so the door handles keep falling off. But I do like the adjustable hinges that come as standard. Obviously, it'll vary from developer to developer, but I've never been particularly impressed with the internal doors that come in new builds. It's just one of those things. You can replace them if you want, but just bear that in mind. That neatly leads me on to all of the trim carpentry. So skirtings, architraves, door frames. In our house, everything, including the door frames themselves, were MDF. I'm not a big fan of MDF door frames, I'll admit, but it never caused a problem. Don't get hung up on it. If I was building a house myself, I would much rather have timber door frames, but I have no problems with MDF skirtings and architraves. They are more stable, they're much less likely to warp and twist over time, so it swings and roundabouts at the end of the day. It's something I'll probably do a future video on, so don't forget to hit subscribe. We've talked about walls in new builds quite a bit on this channel already, so I'm not gonna go into it in a huge amount of detail. Unless you live in a timber-framed house, which I would personally avoid like the plague in the UK, 
then you'll have an outer leaf of brick and an inner leaf of blockwork, all fully insulated in the cavity. And if you're lucky, you'll also have internal solid walls as well. A lot of people sometimes get confused about this and think that they don't have solid walls because if it's a dot and dab, it can sound like a hollow wall but often they are solid walls just with the plasterboard dabbed on over the top. But more often than not, you're also gonna get stud walls, hollow stud walls made with awful metal studs. I can't stand metal studs. Give me timber studs any day, but it's just one of those things. I think it's partly for fire regs as well. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, I've already made quite a detailed video about dot and dab walls. I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel and I'll include a link in the description below all about that. Not a lot to report in the living room. Concrete floors in this house at ground floor level. We briefly talked about that before. Worth mentioning that we had all of the blinds installed after we moved in. Expect bare windows in a new build. Kitchen wise, we just had a bog standard symphony kitchen with integrated appliances. It's what came with the house basically. It was okay, not great. The supplied Zanussi dishwasher was absolute junk. It was damaged when we first moved in and had to be replaced. And then the pump died after three years. Other than that, all of the other appliances were fine. We paid extra for granite worktops, which I highly recommend if your budget permits. The only real annoyance we had with the kitchen was that it didn't come with soft clothes, drawers and cabinets as standard. Soft clothes was pretty ubiquitous seven years ago, so I was quite surprised about that. It wasn't even an optional extra. It was a really basic kitchen. Easy enough to upgrade. It was another job that I just didn't get round to doing, but yeah, you would expect, certainly now at the time of filming this in 2020, I would expect soft clothes everywhere as standard. In terms of optional extras, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, but most UK new builds have a base specification that you can then upgrade as needed. So for example, if you want any extra sockets and things like that, we paid for extra sockets in some of the rooms and extra down lights and an outside tap and we paid for upgraded showers in the en-suites. Talking of en-suites, one thing you'll find with new builds is that the bedrooms are generally a bit smaller. And why are they smaller? Well, it's because they need to make room for all of the en-suites. This house had no less than four toilets. It had a downstairs toilet, it had two en-suites, one with a double shower and another with a shower over the bath and it has a family bathroom with a shower over the bath as well. I know a lot of people rave on about en-suites, but for us, it was excessive. We didn't really need that many bathrooms, and we ended up having one en-suite that literally never got used. We're back in an older house now with a family of four and one bathroom, and we don't really miss the en-suites, to be honest. I know it's a personal preference thing, but if you're wondering why the bedrooms in new builds are a bit smaller, that's probably the reason. The quality of all the sanitary wear, so the ceramics and the taps and everything else was absolutely spot on, couldn't fault it at all. Mixer taps everywhere as standard in our house and we even had a filtered cold water supply in the kitchen, not that we ever used it. We also had thermostatic bar mixers on all three showers and it's also worth pointing out that all of the bathrooms and the utility room have electric extractor fans as standard. And because of this, along with the dot and dab walls, we never had any issues with dampness or condensation. This is a major benefit of new builds that I'll cover off on a future video. A few other perks that you might get in a new build but you might not have in your older property. Towel radiators in all of the bathrooms as standard. Linked smoke alarms everywhere as standard. Carbon monoxide detector in the kitchen as standard. And more electrical outlets than you can shake a stick at. I'm not going to talk too much about the loft since it's a loft. It's packed with insulation. I think 250 mil of insulation as standard. And the only thing up there that we had was a TV aerial, which we never use because for us, everything is online these days. Do bear in mind though, in a new build, you'll generally have to install your own TV aerial. The cabling should all be installed by the builder, but it might not come with a TV aerial. And don't forget as well, if you've got a garage and this house came with a detached double garage, then you'll also have a loft in there as well. So I boarded out our garage loft for storage and obviously built a fully functioning workshop. In terms of the garden, unless you've paid extra, then the garden will be supplied as a mixture of mud and building rubble. 
It may look like soil, but don't let that fool you. We had some areas where the soil was less than 100 mil thick before you hit the yellow sub-base underneath. I landscaped our garden and it's not something I generally advise getting the house builder to do unless you're happy with turf literally being chucked on top of this with no proper grading or drainage. I've heard of a lot of problems where the builder put the grass in and didn't really prepare the site properly and it all ended up having to get ripped up. So I think that covers most stuff in terms of the internals of a typical new build. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the comments. Now, before I show you some before and after pictures of the houses that you saw in the very first episode, I just wanted to cover some comments that do come up from time to time. First of all, a few of you asked how I knew that these new builds have slab on grade as opposed to block and beam. And the simple answer is, is that I lived there for seven years and watched it being installed literally every day. I did manage to get some footage of this for a few houses where it's in the various stages of the slab floor going in. You can see on this one, it's just had the sub base put on top of the bare soil. And then after that, it gets effectively sharp sand put over the top of the sub base. And then there's a damp proof membrane put over that along with insulation and reinforcement. And then the concrete slab gets poured over that. You do definitely get UK new builds with block and beam floors, but that wasn't the case on this housing estate. I haven't seen any houses on this particular development with block and beam, but that's not to say it doesn't exist. Block and beam would always be my personal preference because of the settling problems you get with a slab floor that we've talked about in other videos. And another comment that came up a few times when I mentioned that insulation sometimes gets blown into the cavity, again, I can assure you on this development that that has happened on a lot of the houses because I've watched it being blown into the cavity. But I'm not saying that that's how it's done on all houses. I think these days we are going more for the insulation being put in as the house is getting built. But certainly in terms of our property, I know for a fact that the insulation was blown in because I saw it being done. But yes, now in 2020, I think it is more common to see the insulation being put in as the walls are being built. Right, I'll not keep you waiting around any longer. I know you've been dying to see the houses from three years ago and what they look like now. And generally speaking, these are now lovely family homes. And I know there's people out there who just don't like the idea of new builds. I'm gonna make a future video that discusses some of the pros and cons in a bit more detail because we've done both and I can give you a, a pretty unbiased and balanced view of whether new builds are any good. They're nowhere near as bad as people make out. There are also a lot of frustrations with them, which, uh, yeah, we'll save that for a future video. All I generally say to people is, remember, all houses were new once. So there you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the comments below. I've tried to cover everything that I can think of, but there's bound to be stuff that I forgot about. Do hit subscribe because in future videos, I'm going to be going into some of the details of new builds a bit more. And of course, I will let you know whether we would consider buying a new build again after living in one for seven years. Too much to go into on this video. It's long enough. Take care, folks. Look after yourselves. I shall see you next time. Tatty bye. We'll have this built in, what, two years or something? I'll come back here and it'll be full of houses. Mm -hmm.